Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. Today's video, we're gonna take a look at the Guyton Klinger Retirement Withdrawal Strategy. A lot of folks have asked me about it. So we're gonna walk through it. I'm gonna show you the papers it comes from. I'm gonna give you a lot of resources. I'll link to everything below the video. I'm gonna show you some free calculators you can use to run uh, simulations uh, specific to your own uh, numbers and, and re retirement. And I'm uh, going to look at a number of things, including some pretty, I think, serious criticisms of, of, of the rules. So that's what we're going to do today. Before we get started, you know, on the live Q&A show, by the way, it's every Monday uh, night at 7 uh, p.m. Eastern time. would love for you to join where I do a live Q&A with folks. We've been talking a lot about interest rates, uh, where to get the best ones. I've mentioned Save Better in the past, which is where I've put a, a big chunk of money we're going to use for a home remodel. Uh, but they've actually increased their rates. Just happened uh, the other day. I actually put my money through Save Better. And Save Better is uh, a company where you can basically open up one account and then invest in a, a number of different uh, FDIC insured uh, banks. Uh, I put my money in this one here, which is a, a no penalty CD that's paying 2.55%. So I can you know, I can pull the money out anytime I want. Yeah, you have to wait seven days, but then you can pull it out anytime you want. But I wanted to mention Sally May. They have a 14 month no penalty CD and they just upped their rate to 270. So that's the best rate I can find anywhere. I'll leave a link below the video uh, to that offer if, if it's of interest to you. All right, so with that, I wanna begin by showing you the papers that give us what, what's called the Guyton Klinger Rule. Here is the first one. It was published, as you can see up here in 2004. Uh, and by the way, this is just my app that I use to highlight PDFs. Uh, and uh, it was uh, written by Jonathan uh, Guyton. And uh, it walks through sort of a, 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 I'll call it an early version of what we now know to be Guyton Klinger. He tested it on historical data with, with a 40-year retirement scenario beginning in 1973. And he picked 1973 because, for a couple of reasons. One, it was the start of a, of a bear market, 73, 74, pretty ugly stock market uh, period. It also was in the early stages of what we now know as pretty significant inflation that lasted for a decade or more. And then for folks retiring in 73, after you know, going into the early 80s, uh, you know, for the most part, they had a good ride, but then they had to live through the 2000, 2001, 2002 tech bubble crash, really the worst stock market decline since the Great Depression. And now here we are in 2004 and Guyton, uh, Jonathan Guyton publishes this paper and so it kind of made sense to pick that time period to look at. And then two years later, he and William Klinger sort of refined some of those, uh, that model that he came up with, which we're gonna walk through and published this paper, which is where we get the Guyton-Klinger strategy from. And I'm gonna scroll all the way down. Again, I'll leave links uh, below the video for all of this. Here is sort of a summary of their findings for a 30-year retirement. They also looked at 40-year. Um, we'll walk through some of these uh, numbers, but before we do, we need to understand uh, the decision rules uh, for this strategy. And I'm going to just sort of warn you up front, they're a little convoluted. Uh, conceptually, though, they're easy to understand. So with that, what I've done to try to help all of this is I created a cheat sheet. Here it is. Again, I will link to this. Uh, it's just a, a PDF, uh, Guyton Klinger Decision Rules. And what I've simply done is cut and pasted from that long paper that we just looked at, the basic rules. The first one, what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through them and then we'll go back to that chart and, and, and look at some of the data. So the first rule is what they call the portfolio management rule. In, in a way, what you could think of, this is sort of a rebalancing rule, but the way they do it is they, they create a sort of an order of operation uh, as to where you're going to take your money from during when you're going to pull a distribution. And it's a very convoluted process. Underlying this is this idea that you're going to have multiple asset classes. You're going to have large cap value and large cap growth to say it's two separate funds rather than say a single S&P 500. Small cap value, small cap uh, growth, uh, maybe a REIT. So you have this sort of multi-asset approach. And then at the heart of the portfolio management rule, rule is this number two, where you're going to first draw on distributions from any equity classes that uh, are overweight, meaning the allocation you started with, they've, they've, the allocation has gone higher than that because maybe they did really well that year. Then you're gonna take from any overweight in fixed income. Then if you still need more money to, to get to your distribution number for that year, you're gonna draw from cash. 
And if you still need money, you're going to withdraw from any remaining fixed income assets. And then if you still need money, well, you're probably in trouble, <laughs> but you're going to withdraw, oops, there we go, from any remaining uh, equity or stock assets. Now, you know, there's a little, a few more nuances to this rule, but that's sort of the heart of it. And frankly, it's the kind of rule that I don't think anyone as a practical matter would follow. Now, there is some good news in the paper. They basically say, you know, this rule doesn't really add that much. And in fact, they test uh, uh, their, their withdrawal strategies on a much simpler portfolio involving just an S&P 500 for stocks. So uh, that's kind of what we're going to focus on. It would be hard, honestly, for me to recommend this portfolio management rule to anybody. Uh, very convoluted. Fortunately, the rest of the rules are fairly straightforward. So here they are. First one is the inflation rule, and it's pretty straightforward. You're going to adjust your distribution amount each year by, by the rate of inflation as measured by the CPI. In that sense, it's no different than Bill Bingen's 4% rule. However, right here, you'll cap your increase at 6%. So if inflation happens to be higher than 6%, uh, then you, you won't take that increase. You'll cap it at 6%, and you'll never make up the difference. So if, if inflation ends this year at 8.5%, and you were following this rule, you'd increase by 6%, and that, that extra 2.5%, you'd sort of just lose forever, right? So fairly, I think fairly straightforward to follow that rule. That's the inflation rule. Then we have a withdrawal rule. And what the withdrawal says is, look, yeah, you've got the inflation rule, but actually in some years, we're not even going to take that capped 6%. In some years, we're not going to increase for inflation at all. When is that? Well, it's when two things occur. The first is your portfolio as a whole is down. You had a negative return for the year and that year's withdrawal rate, so you, you figure out what your distribution would be and divide it by your portfolio balance and you get some percentage, right? If that percentage is greater than the, the initial withdrawal rate you started with at the beginning of retirement. So maybe a little convoluted, but not too bad to follow. Now, you'll notice the second part is in italics. Uh, the reason is this, at the beginning of the paper, their initial withdrawal rule uh, didn't have this part of it. It simply said, if your portfolio return is negative, you don't get an increase. Well, they softened the rule a bit, and this, they do this, and they talk about it in sort of in the middle of the paper, and say, you know, we don't have to be quite that stingy. Uh, we only really need to invoke this withdrawal rule and, uh, and, and uh, forego an increase if your portfolio is negative and uh, that, that year's withdrawal rate would be greater than your initial withdrawal rate. So there it is. Now, uh, two more. These are really important. And these, these next two are really what we've call, called in the past guardrails. These are the guardrails. The first one's called the capital preservation rule. The concept behind this rule is uh, if things are going really bad, uh, stock market's down, inflation's up, you need to take a haircut. You need to reduce your, dis your, your distribution. So um, here's the deal. The capital preservation rule applies when the current year's withdrawal rate. So again, you'd calculate what your withdrawal should be, and then you turn it into a percentage by dividing it by your portfolio balance, say, at the end of last year. If it's risen 20% or more, more than 20% above the initial withdrawal rate. So as an example, um, if we started with 5% as our initial withdrawal rate, 20% uh, above that, five, well, 20% of 5 is, is, is 1. So if, if our rate went above 6%, it would trigger this rule. So, you know, we, we, take, we calculate our distribution for a year, we divide by the end, say the, the, the portfolio balance at the end of last year. If that's more than 6%, it triggers this capital preservation rule. Now, they didn't make an exception. They said, look, if you're within the last 15 years of your planning age, so if, you, if you're planning to live to be 100 and you're 90, you don't have to follow this rule. And I think the thought there is you've got so little time left, <laughs> as depressing as that may be, uh, that you probably don't have to worry about the rule. That was maybe the idea. So assuming this rule is triggered, you, you reduce your withdrawal by 10%. That's what you do. And um, the decreased withdrawal becomes the basis for determining, the, determining your future withdrawal uh, withdrawals. You don't ever make it up again. So that's the capital preservation rule. The prosperity rule is kind of the opposite. It's when your current year's withdrawal percentage, again, you calculate your distribution, divide by last year's ending portfolio balance. 
if your current year's withdrawal rate is less than 4%, so that means things are going really well. You're not taking that much of your portfolio. Again, inflation might be low, stock market might be doing great. If it's below 4%, you can take an increase of 10%. So you can think of those as, those are really the guardrails. The capital preservation rule protects you when bad things are happening. The prosperity rule rewards you uh, maybe when good things are happening. So that's the idea. So yeah, definitely a, a more complicated, a more complicated rule, uh, or set of rules. So what's the outcome? Well, let's go back to the chart. So again, this is a 30 year withdrawal rate and all of these abbreviations you can see. So W initial withdrawal rate, right? Um, is what that stands for. And, and the triggers, you can think of those as um, those guardrails we talked about. And there's remember, there's kind of three of them. There's cuts. So that would be, um, you know, that would be the capital preservation rule where you reduce your spending. There's freezes. That's sort of where, um, you know, your portfolio went down and your withdrawal rate was higher than your initial withdrawal rate. So you didn't take a inflation adjustment. And then there's raises. That's the prosperity rule. And this shows you how many times those were triggered under these different scenarios, right? And so what I want to look at, you know, here's multiple class equities is down here. That's again, the, the, the portfolio rule It's very convoluted. I kind of like to keep it simple. And um, you can see he's got three different asset um, allocations. Now, the first number is equities. Second number is fixed income. The third number is cash. So this is overall, if we, if we combine fixed income and cash, this is 50, 50, 65, 35, 80, 20. A couple of things to note. 10% in cash is a lot. I would never recommend that. Um, that is a lot of money. Now, if we reduce that to some smaller number, I don't know the impact it would have on the results. Um, I would think that it would have a positive impact, at least most years or most retirement scenarios, but I haven't actually tested that, but that's just an observation. So uh, we can look at, let's just do the 6535. These are confidence levels. So in other words, they ran the Monte Carlo analysis and how many times you know, did it succeed or fail? And so at 99% using a 6535 portfolio, you could actually start with a 5.2% initial withdrawal rate, significantly above uh, the 4% rule. If you did this, you would have had to cut your spending twice, right? That's on average, on average. Uh, you would have had to have uh, foregone a inflation adjustment six times. But the bright side is you would have had seven raises. So it, it kind of washed out and your purchasing power total turned out to be pretty consistent across all of those time periods. Uh, and your final year purchasing power, I'm not sure how much that matters if your final year, you're 100, maybe it does, actually went up in this scenario, 111%. Uh, percent. You'll notice that these numbers go down typically right? We're looking at this, these boxes here in the middle, um, as your initial withdrawal rate goes up and your initial withdrawal rate goes up. If you can, if you're comfortable lowering your confidence, how many times, you know, the percentage of times that are successful, hope that makes sense. So for example, if you were comfortable with the 90% confidence level, you could actually start with a 6.4% initial withdrawal rate. It succeeds most of the time, but not all the time. You can see the cuts, freezes, and raises, and you actually end up, uh, it's right here, you end up getting a bit of a haircut in terms of purchasing power, but one could argue that, you know, it's not terrible. And then you've basically got the same numbers down here, but with an 80-20 uh, portfolio. Now, I know that's kind of convoluted, and the, the trouble I have with the paper is, I, it's hard to say, what should we do? Should we actually follow a fairly complicated set of rules, even if we ignore the multi-asset portfolio and the portfolio rule, um, it gets pretty convoluted. On the other hand, I like the idea of, of basically making mid-course adjustments, either if things are not going well and I need to cut back, or if things are maybe going better uh, than I might've expected and I can take an increase. I like knowing that. And I think the Guyton-Klinger rule is probably from what I can tell, one of the more practical ways uh, to accomplish that. And the capital preservation and prosperity rules aren't really that complicated to use, frankly, and neither are the inflation uh, or withdrawal rules. Uh, so if we ignore the convoluted portfolio uh, rule, 
Uh, the others are not too difficult, I think, to follow. Having said all of that, uh, there is some pretty big criticism of this rule, and I think it's only fair to share that with you. So uh, to do that, I want to go to a website, and here it is. This is early retirement now, and um, this is a, a well-known site. Uh, the blogger behind this uh, has done a great series on safe withdrawal rates. You can see it here. I highly recommend it. I'll link to this article. And he's looking at the Guyton Klinger rules. I can tell you he's not a fan. And uh, you can read this article, of course, on your own. But what I want to show you is all the way down at the bottom. Here it is. Uh, oops, no, that's not it. No, that is it. What this is showing, this blue line, you can see it up here and it goes straight across. This is the 4% rule and this is all after inflation. So as we know, the 4% rule is a constant dollar after inflation spending. So on an after inflation basis, the amount you spend every year is the same. Straight line, right? These are Guyton Klinger lines with, with different initial withdrawal rates, four, five, and 6%. And you can see, at least with five and six, of course, they start out with much higher well, obviously, 1% and 2% higher withdrawal rates, right? The point uh, that, that's being made here, though, is that in this particular uh, time period, which begins retirement in January of 1966, on an after-inflation basis, how much you can spend takes a nosedive pretty early on, right? Year 4, I guess, into year 5. And regardless of whether you start with 4 5 or 6%, the Guyton-Klinger method ends up with pretty significant shortfalls uh, you're spending about half the 4% rule down here for years, and during the entire 30-year period, you never actually recover. And so that was, I think, at the heart of the criticism of this rule. And the criticism was twofold. It was not only that, uh, depending on when you retire, you could end up spending a lot less on an after-inflation basis, but that Guyton Klinger didn't really do a good job of explaining that. In fact, I think some would say, boy, did they hide it from us? Why isn't that in the paper? Now, I don't think I'm as uh, negative on Guyton Klinger uh, for a couple of reasons. Let me go back to this paper. The first thing is, in doing this analysis, the author didn't actually follow uh, Guyton Klinger to, to, you know, to the letter. Uh, changed the rules in a couple of ways. The first thing, sort of ditch that whole portfolio rule. Now, I don't blame him. I, I, I'd probably ditch it too. Uh, but the other, th you know, but still, if you're going to criticize the rule, you probably ought to test it exactly as is. Now, again, in the Guyton Klinger paper, they pointed out that 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 rule probably doesn't add a lot. So one could argue, you know, that's maybe not um, a, a big deal. But th they also changed a few of, of the other rules. The, f the first thing was they rebalanced on a monthly basis when they did their analysis here. And that's not what Guyton Klinger did. And in fact, I think that could have a non-trivial uh, effect on the results um, because a lot of studies show that rebalancing on a monthly basis is not ideal. And in fact, we had Paul Merriman on the show. Now, it wasn't in the context of Guyton Klinger, but, but in his uh, ultimate buy and hold portfolios, he showed that if you rebalance monthly uh, you know, over long periods of time, you actually get worse results. There's also a practical side. I don't know very many people that actually rebalance monthly. So I think that aspect um, uh, of the rule, um, um, you know, I think it would, it would have been better to test it with that part of the rule and, uh, left in. The other thing is, uh, and I'm coming back over to this part, the withdrawal rule. Remember I said in the middle of the paper, Guyton Klinger added this? Well, um, in this paper, they didn't factor that in. They also got rid of the rule that said in the last 15 years, you, you can ignore uh, that the, the inflation rule. And so there were changes to the Guyton Klinger methodology that generated this table right here that we just looked at. Now, having said all of that, I still think the point being made here is a valid one. If you pick the worst imaginable time to retire, in this case, 1966, yeah, the Guyton Klinger, and, and frankly, just about any dynamic spending rule, you're going to end up spending less than um, at some point than you would have if you just followed a straight 4% rule. And in fact, they call that the crossover point. And how soon you'll cross below that 4% line, and again, if we go back here, you can see it visually. At what point will any dynamic spending rule cross below 
just spinning a constant dollar. In this worst case scenario, it happened right away. But of course, you know, we've looked at about 150 years worth of retirement data. This normally doesn't happen. This is the worst of the worst. So I suppose this graph is important if you really truly, truly want to plan for the absolute worst scenario, at least based on historical data. In most cases, uh, you might not, never cross this 4% line if, if you retire in a quote unquote, you know, good year. But in other cases, uh, you know, you might cross it in year 12 or 14 or 16 or 18 way out here. And that actually might not be a bad thing, particularly if your spending overall tends to go down as you age. And in fact, in this first paper that, uh, that Jonathan Guyton published in 2004, he talks a little bit about those crossover points. So you can check that out in this paper if you're interested. All right, I know I've thrown a lot at you. I do want to give you two other resources to consider. The first is uh, FI Calc. This is a, a calculator, a free calculator we've looked at in the past, and I'll just, so you can see the whole thing. And um, you can set your retirement, length of retirement, your initial portfolio value. We can do, uh, you can set your um, equities, we'll leave it there. And you can set your strategy. One of them, as you'll see, is right here, Guyton Klinger. And the nice thing about this is the capital preservation and prosperity rules, remember it's 20%, you know, when you go off track one way or another, uh, you can change those. You can change those assumptions if you want. Um, you'll also notice you can set a minimum amount uh, of withdrawal, which I think is kind of important. You can also, remember that whole thing about ignoring the rule in your final 15 years? Well, here you can, you can ignore that rule or not. It's up to you. I'll leave that checked since that's how Guyton Klinger uh, did it. And um, we can go back to the paper right here. And let's pick one of these. We're doing 80-10, which is here. And we'll do the 95% confidence level, which would mean an initial withdrawal rate of 5.7. So in a million dollar portfolio, it would be 57,000. How do we do? Well, you can see up here, we succeeded about 96% of the time, which is about right. Um, and we can come down, we can look at the bad years. And uh, not surprising a lot in the 60s. It's, it's interesting here though, that 66 did not actually run out of money, but it certainly came close. Now we can pick one of them, we'll pick 1966. This is the available spend. This really gets back to the point being made uh, here in this article that we looked at. Here, we started out at 57,000. This chart is on an after inflation basis. And you can see we hit rock bottom by 1981 and we never get a raise for 30 years, right? So that's a, a really good uh, visual representation of the problem, uh, potentially, uh, with uh, uh, Guyton Klinger. Now, of course, that's the worst of the worst, right? If we go back, we could pick a different year. Let's pick a, a probably a better year, 1982. Here's our available spend. It does the opposite. It starts here and it just goes sky high. <laughs> so part of the question is, you know, are you going to retire in a quote unquote good year or a bad year? And unfortunately, there's no way to know. In that sense, I was a bit disappointed with Guyton Klinger because I had thought uh, before I looked at all of this that the preservation rule and, uh, and uh, or the excuse me the property the prosperity rule and the capital preservation rule the two guardrails I thought would help keep our our spending more in check than it was um, depending on what year you retired that there would be some variability I got that. I didn't expect it to be so so uh, wide, depending on whether you retire in a great year, a bad year, or somewhere in between. Now, of course, you can use this tool and you can test out, for example, we could say, well, let's trigger this, I don't know, at 15% and this one at 15. And what does that do to the numbers? And you can look at it. There's a lot of different ways you can test this. You can set a minimum withdrawal amount that's different than 20,000. Uh, so you, you can play with this uh, based on your own circumstances, your own asset allocation. I think it'd be very useful. The other one I'll mention is Seafire Sim. And um, again, I'll leave a link to this. This is a free tool as well. You can put in your inputs. It's pretty self-explanatory, I think. Here's where you select Guyton Klinger. They have a number of, of, of different spending rules you can use. Guyton Klinger is one of them. The nice thing I like about this tool is we can run multiple simulations and each one you'll see a results tab here. So this was the first one that I read. Now, just a couple of things. All of these numbers that you see are on, are on an after inflation basis. And these numbers may look, this may look confusing. It's pretty simple, really. These are portfolio values, and this is spending over time. And if you highlight one, you'll see down here, watch down here if I just pick one randomly. You see 
that tells me that uh, I'm looking at the, at the year 1976 for a retirement that started in 1966, and my $1 million portfolio on an after inflation basis is already down to 421. Now, of course, that was a retirement starting in 1966, and we know that was not a, a great year to retire. We could pick a different one, we'll go here. This was a retirement that started in 48. It's now, I'm, high, I'm hovering over 1965 and our million dollar portfolio on an after inflation basis, it's 3.8 million. Yeah, big difference, you know, between retiring in a good year and a bad year. You basically get the same thing over here, but it's based on spending. So we wanna pick a bad year, here we go. Uh, you started in 1973, we're looking at 1991. Uh, our, our spending started at 47,000, that's what I used for the input. Uh, and we're down on an after inflation basis to only spending 20,000. 20, so again, it underscores just how variable the Geitenklinger rule can be, which frankly was a big disappointment for me. Now, you can change some assumptions here if you wanted. We could say, okay, well, what if um, we'll, we'll, we'll cut back, not when it exceeds 20%, but when it, if it exceeds 15%. let us just do that. We'll leave everything the same. You can run the simulation and it gives you a new tab. So you've still got your old data You're from your first simulation. You could compare it to the new data and see the differences. Um, so again, I think a very, very useful tool. Now, I know this has been a sort of a convoluted topic. I've tried to simplify it as much as I, I could, um, but it is a complicated rule. Again, I like the concept behind the guardrails, but I think at least based on the data we've looked at, um, there needs to be some more refinement. So I'm continuing to do more research to see what others have done with this. I think guardrails, I like the idea of guardrails, uh, but it didn't give us the stability of, 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 of after inflation spending that I was hoping uh, it would. At least that was my take. So in many ways, I kind of uh, agree with the results and the, and the um, uh, opinions from this article. I just wish the data that they used was more closely aligned with the actual Guyton-Klinger rule. Again, maybe it wouldn't have made any difference, but I suspect maybe it would have made some difference. Although again, as we saw from like FI calc, still the, the variability of the spending can be pretty significant. So there you go. Uh, again, I'll leave links to all of this below the video and I will be doing follow-up videos with more research on this general topic of spending rules in retirement. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll be happy to help you out any way I can. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. And maybe a good retirement spending rule. That, that, that'd be nice as well.